nobody in the front row. Come on, guys. Mickey won't <laughs> bite you. Just scaredy cats. Okay, so it's a pleasure to introduce our own Mickey Kafarnas today, who I think most of you know. Uh, <clears throat> Mickey did his undergraduate work in psychology at the University of Wisconsin in Eau Claire, and then went on to do his PhD in biopsychology at the University of Michigan, where he worked with James Woods. And from there, uh, Mickey went to Hopkins to do a postdoctoral fellowship um, in uh, behavioral pharmacology research unit with Ken Silverman. And then uh, about six or seven years ago, Mickey joined us here in Roanoke at the VTCRI uh, and has been affiliated with the Addiction Recovery Research Center and uh, Warren Bickles program. And Mickey, as you can see there, is now a research assistant professor here at the VTCRI. Uh, Mickey's background has included uh, animal work as well as human work. Um, he's uh, done some really interesting stuff on looking at dopaminergic systems effects and related to delayed discounting and the, the sort of work that many people at the Addiction Recovery Research Center here are involved with in humans. Um, and has looked at a variety of uh, the role of monetary incentives to reinforce human behavior. Uh, while he was here, he developed uh, in Warren, with Warren a rapid delayed discounting task that I think that has been put into use, and has studied a number of groups, including cocaine-dependent uh, individuals, and uh, how that can affect other behaviors, such as their decision-making about uh, sexual behavior, unsafe sex, for example. Studying decision-making and addiction overall, uh, I think at a large scale, and coming at it uh, various ways. Uh, Mickey's been very successful both in his publications and in his funding. Um, he has uh, currently, uh, on a couple grants, uh, he's a PI in R21 that studies, looks at risky sexual behaviors in stimulant dependent populations, and also a co PI with Warren uh, on another R1 at the moment, uh, looking at reduced nicotine cigarettes uh, in a com complex tobacco marketplace. But more exciting for him is he's uh, a PI on an about to get grant, which looks very, very good. If he doesn't get funded, nobody will get funded, uh, on a grant on uh, uh, remote alcohol monitoring to facilitate abstinence reinforcement. Uh, and I think we're going to hear a little bit about that today. Uh, so Mickey, it's a great pleasure to have you. I look forward to your talk. Welcome. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm happy to uh, share a little bit of our work with you. So, um, as Mike mentioned, I've hands it a few. Oh, is it not? Is it not on? Am I just not loud enough or close enough? Is that? Is it better? I guess, but you might stand in front. Is this okay? I'll just stand here. So, as Mike mentioned, I'm in, involved in a couple of uh, different projects. I'm going to mostly focus on um, this today, just because I'm recently excited to be starting this new project that we'll hopefully be getting soon, and um, uh, we have now uh, one completed project that's kind of in this line of work, and then one that's underway as well, so it's um, sort of a good story developing. Um, so untreated alcohol use disorder is a big problem. One in eight adults in the U.S. at some point in their life meets criteria for alcohol use disorder. Um, really a massive, massive amount of people, and only a quarter of these people of people who meet criteria for alcohol use disorder ever receive any sort of treatment of any kind. This is defined very broadly. This is including sort of self-help type groups. Um, if you look at just sort of um, treatment from a medical professional, it's even far less than that. So there's this huge unmet need. These are just many, many tens, hundreds of millions of people um, uh, that um, uh, meet criteria for alcohol use disorder and don't receive any sort of um, treatment. Not hundreds, maybe. Um, and seven of the ten most common reasons for not seeking treatment relate to an inability or an unwillingness to extend, extend existing treatment services. So as um, we all know, there's this huge uh, stigma around addiction. People are, feel un, uh, uncomfortable going to um, treatment, people saying that they are asking for help, um, seeking help, and even if people were less uh, uncomfortable, if there was less stigma, there's just simply not enough um, available treatment slots available to treat the vast number or the massive amount of people that have alcohol use disorder and other addictions for that matter. Um, so what, we, what I think um, I'm trying to do in some small part is to develop ways, uh, addiction treatment models that can be disseminated widely in sort of a low um, cost way uh, uh, we're using mobile 
technology for that. So the model that I'm using is contingency management. Um, very briefly, contingency management is a very straightforward approach. It just operates on positive reinforcement principles. You arrange valuable incentives to deliver to people um, contingent on verified drug abstinence. Um, this is a great way of initiating and potentially maintaining abstinence for long term. And it's also a great um, addition to other treatment services. Um, it's been shown to be a, a good um, add-on uh, uh, component to treatment as well. So why does this work so well? Immediate rewards are far more valuable as anybody who has been to a uh, talk from Warren or anybody in the sort of northwest corner of the building up here. Um, delay discounting is a thing and people devalue delayed rewards to a high degree. So this is a graph that um, some of you may have seen before. It just plots as a function of delay what the value of money in this case is uh, for control people and then people with an opioid use disorder in this case, although this is true for any substance use disorder including alcohol use disorder. So all of us, um, no matter who you are, you devalue rewards as a function of delay at a pretty high rate. Uh, people with substance use disorders, one of the, in fact, one of the characteristics of substance use disorder is an even uh, much higher devaluation of delayed rewards, um, exceedingly high often. And what this means is that we the um, delayed rewards have very little effect or very little influence over behavior. And as it so happens, many of the sort of natural rewards associated with drug abstinence and alcohol um, abstinence for people with alcohol use disorder are delayed. Um, I have a bunch of high resolution stock photography to illustrate this. So the normal decision that people have to make um, when they're faced with the choice to use alcohol, which is this, um, or to pursue one of these, um, re these rewards is um, a choice between something now and something delayed. So if you want to, so some of the delayed rewards are educational outcomes, family, um, physical health, interpersonal relationships, you know, sort of the gen, the sort of the, the types of things that would make for great motivational posters, um, all of which are associated with absence, but all of which are delayed and often probabilistic as well. So what contingency management does is simply say, hey, instead of choosing between using alcohol now and something that might happen in the future and down the line, you would change the choice to alcohol now or a couple of bucks now or something else that's objective. It doesn't need to be money necessarily. People have arranged um, all sorts of other rewards. There's even some people doing some cool things with um, like video game rewards and stuff, things that don't have actual monetary value but are valuable to the person that is receiving them. But um, often it's, used, it's, it's straightforward to use money because money, most people enjoy money. So um, this has been, this type of approach has been looked at for decades now. It's shown to be effective in all sorts of contexts. Um, and uh, more recently, which is very exciting, it's been frustrating that to sort of be involved in this work and then not see it be used in the, in the world much but that's changing. Um, so it's uh, around the world, there's a number of examples where this is being taken on um, in the NHS and in, in, in England and some other places, but just not too long ago in the US now, um, this is just a paper describing this is a thing that's happening, but um, the VA system, the entire VA system now, it's a, this is an approved treatment approach. Um, uh, any VA physician who's seeing somebody with um, substance use disorder can uh, prescribe and or it can administer this type of approach um, and treatment for person and have it be reimbursed or however the VA does it. I'm not actually sure if it's reimbursement or how their billing system works, but it's it's a covered um, it's a covered expense in the VA. So this is really exciting. Um, I think it's the the evidence has been overwhelming for quite some time and it's now um, uh, becoming a thing that's actually used. So what am I going to talk about today? Um, um, uh, the sort of caveat uh, to all of this, there's been a number of studies showing effectiveness in a wide variety of contexts, but um, alcohol use disorder is sort of the one exception for contingency management approaches as far as um, st good studies showing um, effectiveness. Um, and primarily that's due to the difficulty with assessing alcohol 
use in the real world because the most, the most straightforward way of assessing alcohol use is a breathalyzer. Breathalyzers only give you a few hours of use. They tell you about the last few hours of behavior and it's very difficult to tell if somebody's been abstinent long term just from a logistical standpoint. So this is a study that I was involved in um, back when I was a postdoc where we looked at um, uh, this type of treatment in alcohol users. Um, this is a, the, the main plot from the paper showing there was a significant treatment effect, so that's great. But the, what isn't obvious from this plot is that this study was extremely <laughs> difficult to conduct because how it worked was um, uh, people were given phones or some means of communication and then at times throughout the day, somebody from the research team would call them and say, where are you? Um, we need you, you do for a breathalyzer. And then they'd say, I'm here. This is done in Baltimore. So they'd be like, I'm over on the street or whatever. Somebody would get in their car, drive to the person with a breathalyzer, say, here you go, blow into this. And then um, record their breathalyzer reading and mark it down. Um, that's a lot of effort. And with all of the effort they put into it, trying to contact people and do this, only 60% in this study of the samples were actually collected. So this is a significant effect trying as, as best as possible statistically to control for the huge number of missing samples. Um, it still seemed to be effective, but it's hard to say because of the massive number of missing samples. And even if it's even, even so, this is just not something that people are going to do. This is too difficult. This is too much effort. Nobody's going to drive around everywhere trying to assess alcohol use in people. Um, and in fact, this is an excerpt from a book um, published about 10 years ago. Um, it was a book on contingency management approaches and summarizing the research, and there was a chapter on alcohol. And I just pulled this from that book. Uh, the primary reason for the paucity of CM trials in alcohol-dependent patients relates to their technological limitations and objectively verifying absence. This has been the huge hurdle. So this entire book, you know, this studies, it works for this drug, it works for this drug, everything is great. But then you get to alcohol and it just says, well, it's pretty hard with alcohol. We can't really verify abstinence. Um, but that's not really true anymore. So this is 10 years ago. In the past 10 years, things have changed quite a bit. So um, the most sort of readily um, common example of um, a biosensor that everybody wears or everybody has now is Fitbits. I'm not going to talk about Fitbits. I just, um, but the, the availability and the cost of, um, of biosensors and and, connect, and connectivity devices and connectivity tools has plummeted in the past 10 years to the point where now um, the landscape has changed a lot. And what, oh shoot, I was gonna bring, actually have one of these in my office, I was gonna bring it as a demo, but I didn't, I forgot. Um, but the, um, but the, I, mean, well, I have a couple different devices that we've been using, but this is the primary one for the study that I'll talk about today. Um, um, this includes this uh, breathalyzer that was developed. I've been um, sort of waiting for somebody for years for somebody to develop something like this. And um, a few years back, a company in California developed a breathalyzer that um, was ideal for a contingency management trial because in addition to it being a breathalyzer that is accurate and meets various um, uh, criteria for accuracy, it, contained a high res it contains a high resolution camera in the front right here to take a picture of somebody and it's time to do so in mid exhale so you blow into the device and it takes a picture of your face in the middle of your exhale um, into the breathalyzer. It has a cell phone radio built into it so it automatically uploads the results. This particular device doesn't require um, a cell phone to operate at all. It's completely independent. Um, it uploads the result from anywhere in the country to a server where we can look at it along with the picture and um, it also has um, some tamper detection or tamper um, and things and a GPS, which we're not really using in this study much. And then we combine this with just cell phones to keep in touch with people and remind them, send them reminders. And then um, uh, because we don't uh, necessarily see them every day, or we typically don't see them for long stretches of time, we give them a debit card as well so we can deliver incentives to them in real time. So when they've earned an incentive, either for completing a um, research task, like in an assessment or something, but also for abstinence, we can put a few dollars on their debit card, text them, say, hey, we just put this money in your card. Good job today. Um, it's available for use. 
So the first um, study we conducted that I'm going to talk about was a very simple uh, parallel groups design. Just two people were randomized to two groups, an active group or a control group. We monitored them for a week without anything going on first, and then they were randomly assigned um, to uh, one or two groups. And both groups were monitored throughout the entire, this was just a three-week uh, trial. Three times per day, they submitted a breathalyzer sample. And in the active group, those samples had to be negative, and then they earned an incentive, monetary incentive, if they were all three were submitted on time and negative. In the control group, they just had to submit them on time. They didn't matter if they were um, using alcohol or not. Um, I wanted, to, this is our demographics table. I just wanted to point out, I don't need to go through every line, but um, I often get asked if we get, if how representative our sample is of people. And I just, and, and also I often get asked if this works with, um, lower income people, and, I, and so I've put this in here. The, our median income is very, very close to the Roanoke average. So it's a pretty good cross-section of people. We get, on average, our people are middle-aged, and they have pretty high audit scores. Audit is an assessment of alcohol use disorder, symptomatology, um, 24 is pretty high. 16 is the cutoff for high risk. Um, they're drinking, on average, about six drinks per day. They're not using many treatment services, and um, on average, they have had 20 years of heavy drinking in their lives. So these aren't, um, these are pretty um, heavy alcohol users. So we wanted to evaluate this first study. We kind of, we already know contingency management if all the other parts of the treatment are in line works, but we wanted to evaluate effectiveness of course, but most, but really we, we really wanted to enhance the feasibility and acceptability of this. So those were some primary goals of this first project was to assess feasibility and acceptability. And feasibility we measured with compliance, uh, breathalyzer compliance rates, and also withdrawal ratings. So withdrawal from alcohol is a very potentially serious syndrome. It's one of the few um, drugs of abuse where the withdrawal um, syndrome is actually uh, potentially lethal if it's severe enough. Um, so we wanted to closely monitor withdrawal and make sure we weren't inducing withdrawal unnecessarily. Um, that was primarily Anita's job. She was in, was has been helping out with all of this work, and she helped with that a lot. So our feasibility first was um, measured primarily with just um, sample collection rate. And remember, in our, our the previous study that I I talked about, we had a 60% sample collection rate driving around Baltimore finding people, trying to give them breathalyzers. Here we have over 95% in both groups sample collection rate, and they weren't different from one another. There were a lot of people that never missed a sample the entire time, which I was really surprised by. I thought, I don't think I could have um, never missed one sample the whole three-week period, but they, they really, um, people in general did a pretty good job submitting um, nearly all of the samples on time. Um, and we had very few, uh, on average, withdrawal symptoms, and um, there were zero cases of um, sort of clinically worrisome withdrawal symptoms where we had to intervene in any way. So that was well managed as well. Um, and then this is a, um, so our, 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 this is not something I originally intended to measure, but I just like to point out that we had nobody drop out the entire time, which was kind of awesome too. Nobody dropped out during the entire treatment either. Um, so for effectiveness, we wanted to look at both self-report and objective measures of abstinence. So first I'm gonna look at self, show you self-report drinking, just because that gives us a, a more complete window both before, during, and after uh, the treatment ended. So before, this is just showing people were drinking about six drinks per day. Um, this is their recollection of their drinking from the prior month before the study started. This is the first day of the study here, um, and both groups were the same. Looks like the cyclicity. Yeah. Cyclicity yep. Days real, yeah. So um, in this first study, um, for a couple of reasons, we started everybody on a Monday. Um, we stopped doing that because that's hard to do in practice when you when you have more than a few people enrolling uh, each week. So now we enroll people on any day. But in this study, uh, with a couple exceptions, we made for some people. It's just about everybody was enrolled on a Monday. So these are weekends here. These, if you count back, there's our. Um, those are weekends. So that cyclicity is actually, um, it's probably a real thing. Um, so during, 
this is during the study. So those, I mean, as you remember, there was a one week monitoring only phase. Um, people drank at about the same rate as before the study. And now this is, this, so this, these data are the, um, their sort of retrospective recall of their drinking for the month prior to the study starting. This is now their daily self-report. So every day we ask them in the morning, how many drinks did you have the previous day? And we do that in the morning so that they more likely maybe remember and also so we get the full sort of waking up to going to bed um, assessment at once. Um, so during the first week, they nothing changed much, which was, um, you know, nothing was nothing. We were just monitoring them. Nothing was happening. And then as soon as the contingency started, as soon as the contingent group started getting incentives for absence, they drank far, far less, um, according to the self-report. And the non-contingent group, the control group, were, that was not required to quit drinking to get their incentives, um, their drinking stayed all the same. Um, and then uh, this is the one month following the uh, treatment. So there was a one month follow up session and then we asked them um, the retrospective recall for the previous month, how much were you drinking each day? And um, the, there was actually very little um, self-reported relapse in the contingent group anyway. Um, and the non-contingent group still had higher rates of um, drinking. So uh, uh, we only had a one, one month follow-up in this first study. We're now doing much longer follow-ups, but um, this um, at least was promising for uh, very little relapse following the end of the treatment. And there's another, I'll show you in a minute, there's another bit of evidence that corroborates that. Um, so, the, so that was all self-report. So what about the actual um, biochemical measure or breathalyzer results? So these are the percent days abstinent. Percent days where all three breathalyzers were um, negative in each group. And you can see there's a, there's a pretty big separation here. We had about 85% of days abstinent in the contingent group, and in the control group was less than 40, which corresponds to a pretty huge um, treatment effect. There was nobody in the contingent group that had fewer than half of the days abstinent, which is higher than the overall mean in the other group. Um, this is just the same data plotted in different ways. Just the number of people who, it's these people on the top top here, the people that were continuously abstinent the entire time, had no detected alcohol use throughout the entire treatment phase, and that was also different. You can see it was about 30% in the contingent group. So this is a uh, ethylglucuronide, glucur uh, I, glucur I don't ever know how to say that. Um, it's a urine metabolite of um, alcohol. It gives you, it, it's, um, uh, it's, it can give you a few days of uh, potential alcohol use, although it's highly cross-reactive with a few things. It's not perfect, which is why we're not using it as a primary outcome, but we did collect it at each assessment session to see if this, if this would correspond with our treatment results. Um, so, uh, and it did. So we at, at the end of the intervention and at the one month follow up. So here uh, we both saw we saw our separation in the two groups there. Um, less abstinence rates according to this than the breathalyzer results. But again, this is pretty cross reactive. Plus, this sample was taken a day after the end of the treatment, so they could have had some alcohol in the meantime, because at that point uh, everything was the treatment was over. Um, but at the one month follow-up, we still see about the same separation as at the end of treatment, which, uh, which corresponds to the self-reported data where we saw a um, uh, little relapse in the contingent group. And then these are audit scores, the same uh, measure of alcohol use, alcohol use disorder symptomatology um, at the consent. Um, they were, both groups were about the same, uh, 24-ish uh, by the end of treatment. Um, a lot of these, a lot of the questions on this scale are, um, are over a period of time. So um, like over the past month, that sort of thing, what have you done? So at the end of treatment, there was a little bit of separation, but this wasn't significant. But then again, a lot of these questions were, you know, would include behavior from before the treatment started. But by the one month follow up, um, there was a significant difference between the two groups showing that, again, um, there didn't seem to be a whole lot of relapse and that the alcohol use disorder symptomatology also uh, seemed to be diverging in the two groups. So finally, acceptability. Um, we wanted to assess this because, the, again, the idea is to develop something that could be disseminated widely um, to a number of, or to people who aren't currently engaged in um, treatment is, was kind of one, was one of the goals of 
this at the outset. So we wanted to know, are people willing to do this? Do they enjoy it? Were they, would they endorse this as something they were, um, they would tell their friends positively about? So um, we asked a number of questions about the approach. Um, first was sort of ease of use type questions. How easy was it to use the various components of the system, the debit card, the cell phone, the breathalyzer, the um, adhere to schedule requirements, and then use the, um, how clear was the payment system, the contingencies. And um, it varied a little bit from category to category, but they were all rated pretty highly. Um, no differences between the groups, but then there was no differences between the groups in sort of how they experienced these various components of the treatment. Um, for effectiveness, um, there was a little difference, at least in this one category, but visually it seems like about the, you know, a little bit of difference in each of these um, between the two groups, which is good because the contingent group showed a lot more effectiveness in their actual results. But we asked them how satisfied they were, how helpful is the feedback, and how helpful were the payments. and. Um, Again, rated highly and a little bit higher in the contingent active group. And then sort of some overall questions, how taking all things into account, how satisfied were you and how likely would you be to recommend this to somebody else? And both of those, again, a little rated quite highly and somewhat higher, slightly higher in the contingent group. Um, this is just showing acceptability over time. We asked them at intake what they thought, what they would think of you know, at that point, they hadn't experienced it yet. They, we, they just knew or we had described it to them. But this is just showing that as they experience the parts of the treatment, their acceptability went only up. So each of these three um, evaluators evaluation seemed to go quite well in this first initial um, study. And um, I've been this slide labeled future directions, but it's not really future. This is a study we're currently conducting as a follow-up. Um, we, are, we are currently um, finishing up a study that's very similar in design, except people are required to pre-fund some of their own uh, incentive payments. So one of the questions I often get with this type of research is how do you pay for it? I think that's, I, I, the question really bugs me because it's, it's not expensive compared to like any other sort of treatment. and. The incentives are just a few dollars. The whole package is not expensive to, to deliver, but people have a problem for some reason with giving incentives for substance use. People have, tend to not have a problem with that when it's some other behavior or change, like um, eating better or working out or um, so on. Um, as part of my uh, health care that I get from here for the Aetna plan, at least the one I'm signed up for, um, I get $50 for getting a flu shot and a few other um, a few other um, incentives that way that for things they should be doing anyway. So nobody seems to have an objection with that. But people, anyway, we ran a, we were doing a study to um, address some of that. If you ask people, will you pay for this yourself, will we still show good results? And um, so we're running the study. People have to pre-fund uh, $75 of their incentives. They can earn more than that back, so they're not paying for all of it, but they're having to give us $75 to get in. And these are the results so far. You can see the ends aren't uh, fully fleshed out, but um, we're getting there. But so far, if anything, it's even more effective um, in the people that sign up for it. So we're getting 95% like abstinence rates in the contingent group, and a similar a little under 40. The, the non-contingent group is about the same as the first study, but the contingent group is even higher now. Um, so we're kind of trying to tap into some of this loss aversion. People start out in the hole, $75, and the only way to earn their money back is to quit drinking. Um, and this seems to be pretty effective. However, the major caveat, um, a lot of people don't want to do this. This is our, our, our um, um, we get a lot of people who aren't interested as soon as they find out about the $75 in the first place, but then even of the people who sign up for the study, they're well-informed. We tell them at the front, you know, you're going to have to pay us $75. Um, will you sign up for this? They say yes. Then when it comes to the time to actually give us the money, they say, I don't have it or I'm not, I'm not going to do that. They, um, they, they um, won't pay or aren't able to pay $75. So um, this actually has happened 11 times so far where people sign up for the study and then a week later when we come to collect the deposit, they say they don't have it or they can't get it or they don't want to. They want to drop out of the study at that point. 
and compare that, that's almost a third of the overall sample. So that is the major caveat, is that this um, can work, but um, you're missing a lot of people. You're only getting sort of the more motivated people or the people that have the financial resources to do so. All right, so what else we are, where we're going with this? Um, I, as um, Mike mentioned, I will probably be getting uh, another grant soon to look at a few more um, aspects of this. So for this one, we're using a different breathalyzer. Um, we're using this one, a backtrack breathalyzer. It's much smaller. It doesn't have a camera built in, but it is Bluetooth enabled. So we um, have built a smartphone app to interface with the breathalyzer and take a picture, handle some of the, um, uh, some of the verification uh, components that the other breathalyzer had, like the, the app will take a picture of the person and, and so on. But, and what this allows us to do is, um, is not only are these considerably cheaper, but um, we can um, control the sort of user interface and experience a lot more, and we can deliver assessments and, um, and have more sort of uh, rich interaction with the people as they go. And so this is the direction I'm really excited to be heading in and what we'll be starting to do in this next project. So this next one will be um, looking at, in a community sample, the duration of incentives and persistence of effects in a much larger sample and a much um, uh, more fleshed out way using this more flexible model. And then we'll also, um, in a second aim with Karelian Psychiatry, looking at integrating this into clinical services to prevent relapse and readmission after um, people are discharged from inpatient detoxification unit for alcohol. So people who have um, come to Kirlian for um, whatever way they do and end up in the detox unit, um, we will try to enroll them if they're interested and use this platform to uh, prevent um, relapse. And for that, we've this is a this picture here um, is the app that comes with this. This is an ours. Um, ours is here as a picture of somebody submitting a sample, and our app. Um, it's this. This is a picture from a little bit ago. We've it's it's changed in appearance a bit since um, I took the screenshot, but um, so far the app um, functions. It it reads the controls the breathalyzer. It allows us. Whoops. It allows us to um, submit samples and, and interact with the person. And um, you can see it takes a picture of your face as, it, as the sample is submitted so we can get user verification. Um, and allows us to send notifications, captures photos, transmits results. And we're also going to be doing assessments through this and having people log their drinks and report withdrawal ratings and all sorts of fun things right in the app itself, um, which will, I think, make the whole thing a lot more flexible and seamless to deliver. And then, um, right, so these are some to-dos on the, on the list. But we said we were going to do all these things in the grant, so we'll have to get that done in the next few months. Um, and then some future directions. Um, I, so I was, I'm really excited about this line of work because I can, um, I think it has great potential to, to be developed in a number of different ways, one of which is um, uh, with additional devices. So we're already, um, John, who's in here, who's been developing this app for me, has already um, been working on integrating the smokerizer. So this is a, um, this is, there's no scale here to tell how big it is, but this is pretty small, <laughs> this device. Um, it's portable. It's a, it's a carbon monoxide uh, monitor that, that plugs into a smartphone. So you, we can measure um, CO on the road and also get, uh, uh, in the same way with breath alcohol, we can get breath carbon monoxide. And I've submitted a grant to do this. Um, it'll be reviewed in a month or so. But um, there's actually good evidence to show that, um, contrary to at least what I expected, um, what seems to make sense, that's treat, getting people to quit smoking and drinking simultaneously is actually more effective and can go smoother than trying to do one at a time if, for people who drink and smoke. So I um, um, submitted a grant to, um, to do this and try to, to, to recruit people with poly substance use who smoke and meet alcohol use disorder criteria and, and see if we can get them to quit both at the same time with both devices um, combined with the app. 
down the line more. There's, there are devices being developed. This is a much anticipated device that doesn't exist yet, but it has this, but you can download this photo on the website of the company that they were promoted. They've been promoting it for literally for like two years now, saying it's going to be out any month now, and then it's never out. But it's supposed to happen <laughs> um, someday. But they're not the only company working on this. There's, like actually, there's a number of companies um, working on transdermal alcohol sensors, which you wear, which you'll be able to wear like a watch. There's actually one that already exists. It's just huge and bulky and looks like a. Um, a uh, ankle monitor that, uh, cr that that's used in um, uh, to monitor criminals. Actually, there's a picture online. Lindsay Lohan had one um, it, when she was arrested for um, some. What was she arrested for? Something related to alcohol and a crime. And she was um, her ankle bracelet was the kind that also measured alcohol. So it's it's a technology that's been out there, but there's a lot of there's companies that are working on miniaturizing it and making it sort of more um, socially acceptable to. Uh, to wear one of these devices in a more um, appealing format. So this is the um, prototype, and um, they do exist. There are um, um, some out in the wild, although they aren't commercially available yet um, from this company and a few others that measure alcohol transdermally. And this is super exciting because of the, because the devices of combined with Bluetooth connectivity will allow us to continuously know if somebody is drinking all the time. There's about a 10 or 15 minute delay just because it takes that long for some of your alcohol when you drink alcohol is um, metabolized through your skin. It actually evaporates off of your skin and that's how these devices work. They pick that up and they uh, measure it. It takes about 15 minutes for that to happen from the time you drink an alcoholic drink to some of it starts to come out of your skin. But um, um, within 15 minutes of a drink being consumed, we would, we would know with a device like this. So this is something that I'm really excited about incorporating when they finally are um, for sale into this sort of thing because it would allow for even more sort of targeted and timely um, intervention. We could then know um, shortly after somebody starts drinking that they're drinking and send the messages and intervene and ask them questions and so on. Maybe offer an additional incentive to stop once they started, that sort of thing. Um, and more. What was I going to say there? So. Um, um, so that's, um, I, I kind of have a break here, so maybe I, w I was going to sort of switch gears and just because I wanted to highlight or briefly mention some of the other things I've been doing. I have a few extra slides about other things, but maybe we could break and if people have questions, do that now and then move on to the other things. Yeah. So uh, thank you. one of the things I'm curious about is... <coughs> Relating what you're measuring in a breathalyzer to other aspects of the person's behavior, their drinking behavior, and the effects of alcohol on them. So you just alluded a little bit to metabolism and, and uh, alcohol coming out of the skin that the sensor works on. I imagine there are individual differences in absorption, metabolism, and so forth, for mm -hmm. example. So working your way back to what the person actually consumed yep. might have challenges. But so I'm curious if, if that's important trying to you know, manage the behaviors, but also secondarily, the other aspects of behaviors. Are there other apps or other data you're collected or collecting or interested in collecting to tell you about the, effect, the effects on person X versus person Y, mm -hmm. this many drinks in a day, and whether they're getting positive feedback? And are you monitoring any other levels of uh, cognitive awareness or performance or you know, anything else other than the alcohol itself? Yeah, so we're measuring, not every day, but we're, we're getting all sorts of data from them. We have an, uh, a huge battery of behavioral and cognitive assessments and tasks that um, they get when they start the study and then periodically throughout and then following up for, um, in the study that will be starting and into a year after um, it ends, we're following them for an entire year afterward. Um, so we'll be able, we'll know the long-term um, effects, to what we'll, we'll be able to try to predict what, um, interpersonal factors or cognitive performance on tasks or, um, um, or responses on questionnaire items, predicted treatment effect, if that's the case, if we can, if some of those, um, some of those relationships exist. Um, um, and we'll also be able to monitor through some um, simple cognitive batteries that we have built in, to, you know, if, if, if there's any sort of change in cognitive um, capacity as well. Um, the this those assessments are all done about every month throughout the 
in, throughout, every, throughout the study, both during and after. Um, uh, down the line, I'd, I'd, I'd love to, once we get the basics of the app functioning, to even include more sort of real-time stuff, especially to coincide with some of these, if some of these sensors, uh, when they become available, um, to, I think that, would, that there's a lot of potential there to start um, learning really in, in, in um, uh, with good time correlated detail what precedes and predicts and follows what related to alcohol use. So if I can just rephrase the first part of my question again, ask it another way. Um, is, is what the person who has a drinking disorder going after the physiological concentration of alcohol in their blood and brain that you will measure with the breathalyzer indirectly mm -hmm. from what's exhaled? Or is part of it the to consume a certain number of drinks and go through the behavior that they're also addicted to? You talked about the relationship of smoking and drinking and, mm -hmm. and well-known you know, relationships with that kind of conditioning. So what is it they're after? Obviously the alcohol, but is, is the behavior getting there or just the absolute level <clears throat> what they're seeking? And the reason I ask that is, again, back to this point of what you're measuring and what you're not measuring. You're measuring the final concentration. Or yeah indirect variable of that. So how important is it, you know, based on different metabolism of different people, that, that it's the drinking act itself and the number of drinks versus right. the final concentration? Yeah, so with the current, with the current uh, breathalyzer, unless we ask people to blow in the breathalyzer every 15 minutes throughout the day, um, it's very difficult to actually quantify just how much so they're drinking. This is the hope is that this will um, improve that. The, however, the, the reason why they, are, they aren't available yet um, for sale, they, they exist, they're developed, they're done. Um, what's, holding the, um, what's holding them back from the company selling them is they, the, with transdermal alcohol sensing, there's a lot more individual variability in how much alcohol makes it out of your skin. It's, 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 there's just skin thickness differences from person to person, but also if you're sweating, if you're working out at the time, if you're um, if, you, if you're in a human environment, if you're in Arizona, it's all, all that matters a lot more than with a breathalyzer where it's very consistent from person to person. There's always a rough, within a pretty narrow range, a certain percentage of alcohol metabolized out of your breath. Um, so the, the idea is that and the, what, all, what this company and, the, and, and others are working on that um, are studying transdermal alcohol sensing um, from a research standpoint is working that out, figuring out um, what things you need to enter in and what things you need to measure to be able to accurately assess how much people, the actual quantity somebody's drinking. But we actually, I think, are in a unique position, or will be in a unique position, once we can get these. Um, um, I would be more um, interested in just, um, regardless of all of the quantity measure, or quantity problems with assessing with these, um, it's, it's easy to tell when somebody starts and stops drinking. That's pretty reliable. It's just sort of the magnitude that's hard to quantify. But we're also, we're in a position where we'll have people with their app and with, we can get, we'll have also have a breathalyzer there. So we can do something like when we detect alcohol at the transdermal sensor, ping them and say, hey, can you submit an extra breathalyzer sample? We'd like to know how much you've been drinking. And from a breathalyzer sample, um, again, if you do them frequently enough, it's, it's pretty straightforward to tell roughly how much alcohol within a few drinks somebody has consumed. So we'll be able to tell that sort of thing more um, with, with greater ability even early on, even if the company hasn't or others haven't worked out exactly all the variables that need to be worked out. Um, with this platform, we would be able to, we wouldn't really need to know that. We would just, I would be more interested in just using this to kind of get um, a signal saying, hey, somebody just started drinking some amount of alcohol. Um, but the, you know, I think the quantity is important and meaningful. Of course, if somebody, um, 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 I've gotten questions a lot before, like, can you, um, you know, I, and one of the responses or the, one of the reviewers for the grant, the first time I, we submitted this was, um, we think you should, we should only be targeting abstinence. You should be targeting moderation um, of alcohol, like, if, you know, target a outcome where. It's acceptable if somebody drinks one or two drinks per day, for example. Um, and, I told, and my response was, we can't really do that with breathalyzers, could act it a few times per day. But um, I could potentially do that with some of these other devices. And I think that's a great, another future um, um, opportunity for development because there are a lot of people out there who are, have alcohol use disorder and drink excessively and say whether or not they will be able to 
to achieve it or not, they really don't want to quit. They want to limit themselves to one drink per day. Um, so being able to assess that and quantify that, I think, is pretty important because most of the research, while alcohol is never really great for you, it's one drink per day is not that big a deal. Um, it was three per day, and they were spread out throughout the day for the first study, because mostly because of the um, way the platform worked. They were not randomized. People picked their own, but with a lot of restrictions, they had to have one in the morning, they had to have one as late at night as possible, and then to have one in the middle of the day, and there was a lot of, um, um, they had to, they, the breathalyzers had to cover the entire day, but they could tweak them, they could tweak the times a little bit based on their work schedule and stuff like that. So. Um, we didn't necessarily capture drinking after they went to bed at night um, because they do after their third one, they were done for the day and they wouldn't have another one until early in the next morning. So um, they could and probably did drink some after in that time that was undetected. Um, and we actually asked them that. We told them um, if, you, if um, I should do this a different way. Um, we told them, um, please be as honest as you can and there was no negative consequence for telling us that you drink alcohol without it being detected by us. Oh, great. Um, and this would really help us out to know that we didn't. Um, um, so in the self-report data, um, you know, again, they could, they could have not been telling the truth, but, but we strongly encourage them to say, hey, um, there's, no, there's no contingency tied to these reports, please. If you have been drinking, and we, and even if you know you, it wasn't detected, and we gave you the incentive, please tell us. Um, it's you know you've already gotten the incentive. This is the next morning. Um, we want to know if you if this happened. And some people did. A lot of people. There was a, there was like two people that consistently said two 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 every single day, um, even though they always earned all their incentives. But um, um, this kind of goes back to the moderation of drinking outcomes um, idea in that. The way the schedule was arranged, it would be very difficult to drink more than a couple of drinks, but there was the possibility in the way we did it the first time to get away with a few drinks per day. Yeah. No, it looks like it's a little bit less, but no, there wasn't. Anything else? Yeah. Did you have um, smokers were included in the study, right? Yeah. So did they, did um, did they change their uh, smoking behavior as well, or only? Um, I haven't actually looked at that. Did we um, have that data, but I haven't looked at whether they, they smoked they less? Or they changed their behavior in the follow-up, even though they were not paid for it? Yeah, no, I, that's so a good question. Right, that's a good question. I don't, um, I'll, I'll, I'll look at that. I haven't, yeah. Um, for the slide that has like the treatment effectiveness, like those bar graphs, mm -hmm. uh, was there an effect, I think I saw in the non-contingent uh, group as well? It was, it may be. Before that, sorry. Um, yeah, it was the bar graph right above this one. I have to play it because of the way I did this. So it seems like uh, some of them were motivated to not drink as much, even though they weren't incentivized monetarily to, to reduce their drinking. Is there possibly some component of the way that they just report in general that decreases the desire? Maybe. Um, I mean, all of these, everybody, that, to get in the study, they had to be interested in treatment. They had to be interested in quitting. Um, oh. So these were all people that um, had an interest in alcohol use treatment, at least in theory, they weren't engaged in treatment elsewhere actively, really, at least at very low levels. Um, so yeah, and there has been research showing that this type of monitoring helps people quit. Just see, seeing a graph or seeing every day, getting feedback every day um, on their alcohol use or other substance use can help people quit, especially if they're motivated to quit. So yeah, um, that's fully possible. We didn't really see an effect in actual alcohol use, at least self-reported or with the breathalyzer ratings um, in the non-contingent group in this study. But people have shown that in the past where um, just monitoring itself will um, decrease use. Is there any questions? 
All right. Um, I put a few slides in here just to, because it's kind of a uh, job talk. I put a few slides in here kind of highlighting a few of the other things um, we have going on, I have been working on. Um, so I can go through those slides if you guys entertain me. So one of the things, um, as Mike mentioned, Warren and I have a um, grant together to look at um, uh, reduced nicotine cigarettes, and I had a small grant from uh, VCU um, uh, to look at e-cigarettes. Um, so I've been uh, um, engaged in some of this um, with the lab. We've shown, or we're looking at how, so the FDA has interested in um, uh, we're decreasing the amount of nicotine in cigarettes to um, uh, potentially help people quit smoking. They're thinking of, as a, as a regulatory action, um, reducing the amount of nicotine in cigarettes to an extremely low level so that people are no longer addicted to nicotine because they're not getting any nicotine, at least from cigarettes. Um, um, and they're soliciting research to examine this. So we, we got a grant to look at these in, a, in this model that Warren developed, the Experimental Tobacco Marketplace. Um, and then also in a in-lab model where I re will relate um, abuse liability measurements, we have like abuse liability, but abuse liability measurements to plasma nicotine, blood levels of nicotine to sort of try to quantify the relationship between um, the rewarding effects of cigarettes and the abuse liability of cigarettes and the actual amount of nicotine that people um, ingest. Because surprisingly, there's very little of that work out there um, um, prior to sort of this initiative by the FDA. So that's one of the things we're working on. Um, did a very similar thing with the plasma nicotine um, and e-cigarettes and found that blood nicotine was related to these various demand parameters um, in the order that you would expect. And these are all blinded doses, so people weren't, didn't know how much nicotine they were consuming in an electronic cigarette, but it was related to their um, abuse liability. Um, that one actually, probably not gonna update. Um, this is, um, a uh, graph from a grant that, that uh, um, um, Stephen Leconte and I and Warren and some others have uh, just finished up looking at risky sexual decision making in stimulant users using a sexual discounting task and um, seeing so stimulant users um, have greater incidence of risky sexual behavior and so we're comparing um, risky sexual decision making, making people making the choices between safer sexual practices and risky sexual practices in the fMRI to compare how their processing of these stimuli and um, decisions differ, if at all. Um, and so far, these are just preliminary analyses, but we have found some differences that look like they could be interesting between the two groups of stimuli users and controls. Um, and then also, as um, Mike mentioned, I've been making a lot of tasks. I've kind of really like making tasks and kind of getting in the weeds of behavioral economic things. So I have this, uh, this is another sort of line of work that I've um, really been interested in is, is improving analyses for behavioral economics things, developing tasks that are more flexible and more adaptable and then um, briefer, but are more appropriate for clinical assessments. And I don't know if anybody wants to jot this down, but you can take my five child discounting task, our five child discounting task online. Um, it's a discounting task that only takes about 30 seconds to a minute and is great for assessing discounting extremely quickly. Um, and then also I'd like to acknowledge for all the different lines of work, um, all of the people that have helped and been involved, which is a large number of people, both within ARC and in um, Karelian Psychiatry and um, NIH for funding. So that was the end of my thing. Thank you. Right. 
Yeah, so it, it's, it's a mixed bag. There are reports showing that after you end the treatment, people relapse immediately. There are reports showing that people, um, the results last quite a while, uh, or the effects last quite some time. Um, it's also the case that pretty much for any addiction treatment, there's a lot of relapse right afterwards. This is something, um, uh, this is a, this is a, many people call it a chronic disorder. It's not something that you just bring someone in for a, a visit and then cure them and send them on their way. So one of the great things that I'm really excited about and one of the things that we're actually looking at in this project is um, um, I'm comparing the duration of incentives and specifically with this, um, uh, we'll, uh, with this very low cost um, model uh, or schedule of an incentive delivery. So we'll um, deliver the intensive version to everybody that we used here that, where they get incentives every single day and we assess them many, many times. And then we're examining that versus one where for another um, almost two and a half months, um, they'll get uh, lower value incentives that have been shown to be effective in, in, in their own right. But um, see if, if we maintain the incentives at a low level for a long time, if we can really sort of stretch out the duration of effects. Because sometimes people do, or often people do, you do show relapse um, shortly after. Um, as far as the intrinsic motiv the motivation part of it, um, I'm sort of less, you know, um, if it, uh, I'm less about that that factor. I'm less concerned about that factor. If it's more concerned about whether they relapse and whether that leads, you know, if whether or not, however you measure motivation, if if they if they continue to drink or not. Um, so in our first study, we were, I was actually surprised. We, we saw no evidence of relapse at one month. We're looking at much longer um, durations in the future and then also examining some of these ways to sort of extend out um, the duration of incentives at a level that's low enough where there's really no reason why you couldn't just keep doing it um, you know, long term if, you, if, that's, if, that's what it's, if that's what's required. And, it's, and that's shown to be effective. So that's how I've been approaching it. Okay, if not, thanks very much for being for sure.